Well, my LE radar is working because. Caught up with this young lad, picking up marulas on the ground that have fallen from this tree. And he was facing us. There's beautiful light on him, I'm going to have to a bit of the light, more of it in a northerly direction. Let's go down this way around this little triangle. These zinnias are starting to fade now. They were so lovely and red against the green. It'd be nice if they could fade before they seed. Jumbo Tembo. Graffiti Yungu. Yeah, just, why don't you just turn your back on me all the time? Why don't you? And a monarch. African monarch flittering near his feet, but it's gone now. Here it is, coming closer to me. Come here, butterfly. Ellie, butterfly. Butterfly for Ellie. There's a type of sage here on the open area that the monarchs seem to get some nutrients from, or perhaps they use it as a host plant. There is, of course, the milkweed. But I can't imagine they're laying, egg they're laying eggs right now. Who knows? Anyway, through the beautiful marula tree, very typical shape of a marula tree, beautiful large round crown, and always some lovely flat branches that are kind of grown specifically for leopard to lie on and forks in the trees that are designed to hold their kills. This is one of the reasons why you have pretty much a predominance of, in, in some areas of, of leopards using marula trees. Uh, in some cases, in some places in other parts of Africa where we've had, where I've lived with big sausage trees that are also very, very large bigger than these marula trees. They love the sausage trees because it's a very big leaflet or very big compound leaves that provide perfect shade. Okay, we're not going to go far. We're going to watch him for a while. And while we've got him, Scott's got something for you, so we'll see what will come back to me in a bit. Me and the Ellie. I'm back, folks. And look at this beautiful, beautiful, dark, dark giraffe bull. I believe he has been seen before. I think Mark found him. I certainly haven't seen this one. He is an incredibly beautiful specimen. Let's watch closely, he's chewing the cud, so he's just swallowed a bolus, and watch his throat very closely, we'll see the next one coming up and popping into his head. I'll let you know when to watch, so keep watching kind of his track here, I guess, along the front of his throat, and you'll notice, if you watch very closely, a small little lump move upwards and then pop into his mouth. Keep watching closely. Come on. I think you may be not too interested in my plan, but we can still keep watching. He hasn't moved, and I'm fairly sure he could be chewing the cut. I saw him just swallow one mouthful, and he hasn't been eating any leaves, so it would be cud that he's chewing, and they typically process bolus after bolus of cud. And re chew the vegetation to make sure they digest it. And 
and efficiently as possible. And you can actually see the ball traveling up his throat usually, but he may have just got stage fright. We may go as we can. Then we would from one vehicle. So I hope you've been enjoying the elephant bull sighting. And we've come across now to another very large herbivore that roam this wilderness, and that is this beautiful big bull giraffe. Usually they're not nearly as dark as he is, and it really is impressive when they do get this dark. It is a combination of age and genetics, and also gender to degree. The males typically get far darker than any of the females. And off he goes, just like that. It's sadly very thick into this riverbed where he's heading, so we're not going to be able to stay with them. There's no roads that follow alongside us. But I might be able to just reverse to give you one last shot of his face in the sun. Welcome everybody, welcome to my world of elephants. Because really, they're the kings of the African bushveld, most certainly. There's a lot of uh, myth and legend and storytelling about the lion is the king of the jungle, but it's not true. Because when you think about it, lion had cat compared to an elephant, and elephants can chase lions away, and well, elephants go wherever they want. They don't have territories. They roam over hundreds and hundreds of kilometers and they go wherever they want and everything moves out of their way. So, true masters of their environment, they are pretty much responsible for everything being here. The way elephants and trees have, have adapted to each other, to the presence of each other. Almost being a, well, elephants need trees as much as trees need elephants. You can see him just popping those mar marulas into his mouth. Got really good aim. We'd love to, love to find how you can get that in slow motion or something. But literally sort of picking them up and flicking them into his mouth from a good few inches away. I mean, it's a good six to eight inches away. Then he's just, come one more. Let's see one more. Oops. Now, some of you might remember we've had an elephant that has lost trunk. Uh, its trunk. We've seen a few actually over the years. And people have asked me how it affects their feeding. And I lived with an elephant up in Tanzania that had lost the tip of its trunk and it was most incredible to watch it eating marula fruits because it didn't have those two little fingers at the end of the trunk to be able to pick up a marula fruit, which is about, I say a little bit smaller than a golf ball, like a ping pong ball, ping pong, table tennis. I'm going to have to move Brian, I think, to do some yoga in the back there to follow him. This cloud moving in pretty quick. Anyways, this little elephant used to load them up his nostrils. Like a pea shooter. And then pop them into his mouth like a pea shooter. It was the most incredible thing. But just his, his, his power to adapt to things, to things that were too big to sort of put into the, the actual nostril part of his trunk. It was amazing. He would make, he would curl his trunk into a little cup shape, or, or, or he'd curl the tip of his trunk 
and he'd actually roll the big doom palm fruits and other other larger fruit. He'd roll them onto his his trunk with his front foot. Well, it's a hand, really. It's not a foot. I don't know why we call animals four-legged because they don't. They, the bones in their front. I mean, they've got shoulder blades. They've got the same palm bones that we have. Just that they walk on their hands and their feet. So they're four-limbed rather than four-legged. If we look at him, we can see, as he, he's going to walk past us and we'll be able to see it, and maybe I can do a pita maneuver. There, there's my finger. But what I want to do is, you can see, there's his elbow. Let me go again. We need to go the other side of him so we can see his him in the light moment. It's a little bit dark because we're looking into the sun. Where are you going, Tembo? Can we walk with you? Or can we go with you? I'm going to wait till he goes past. I'm going to go behind him and come to the western side of him. JB in the UK wants to know what those white spots are in the corner of his eye. It's mucus and accumulated mucus because he blinks a lot. Because you can imagine, sorry boy, did I just I don't want to push you on further? I just want to get to the western side. I don't remember he's, he's feeding it out, he's walking through brush and grasses and trees and, and there is, it's getting quite dusty nowadays and I suppose more so now going into the dry season, although we, we're not quite there yet but it is getting a bit dry and there is a bit of dust. The whole purpose of blinking, much as it is with us humans, the whole purpose of blinking is to get rid of foreign things, dust and other particles on the eye itself and so by blinking you're actually moving all of that stuff wiping it all off into your lower eyelid and, and, and just the way the eye is situated it eventually ends up in the corner of the eye much like it does with us where our tear ducts are which is where the, 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 the eye produces moisture for the eyeball to to not dry out because it's cleaned and you'll find some, sometimes you'll actually find elephant curling their, tongue, their trunks the tip of their trunk into like a little fist and rubbing their eyes in very much the same way we do when we wake up. He does have a very slight must smell about him. He is leaking from his temporal glands. Um, he's not bubbling between his legs. And that drum goes back again next to his face, but he's pulling quite hard on that combretum, and it, the drum goes finding it hard to balance. Oh, drum goes right there next to his trunk. Question from Ellie about Tanzania. What's up, dude? Got a mask. Full of this, I think it's Rhodes grass. It's a grass that only really grows on termite mounds, and he's been picking a lot of it. What's that? Something else? Just taking a few leaves. Back to a marula tree to look for fruit. 
and his accompanying drongos. Ellie was asking a question about game viewing in Tanzania. And well, Ellie says that she's heard that there is a lot of overcrowding and, it, and it's discouraged her from, from visiting Tanzania. I have to agree, there are places where it is so overcrowded and there's no, there are no rules like we have here in South Africa. And it's kind of a hard one to monitor, it's a hard one to police, it's a hard one to, to have a, the equivalent of what we have here, sort of the guide grading system where guides are compelled to, to pass exams and, and, and have certificates and qualifications. There is guide there is body, there are those professional guides that have found their way to the places where it isn't crowded and where their expertise and their passion and their knowledge comes in handy. The thing is that because there isn't really a... a, a well, she's going to chew all the sand off of those roots, pulling up a lot of the zinnia, funnily enough. Just going to chew the grass, the, the, the plant part, and drop all the roots. There we go, drop them all. Shaking sand off of a lot of the roots too. You see in... Some of the, some of the um, iconic parks, some of the, there are so many national parks in Tanzania, but there are all the other national parks in terms of revenue and visitor numbers, and that's places like um, Serengeti and Ngorongoro Crater and one or two others. And most of the other parks and, and reserves are so inaccessible that you can only get there by a small plane, and then it sort of it, the cost becomes a factor. So there's a different type of guiding, but there's also a different type of of utilisation of some of the, the lesser known parks. So most certainly, in some of the really popular areas, and Gorongoro Crater and the top half of Tarangiri National Park, Lake Manyara. Uh, part of the Serengeti, for example, are areas where you will find crowding because anybody can just take a minibus, a pop-top minibus, and, and go take find people at an airport or at a hotel and, and take them in. You just have to be a, you just have to have the vehicle. Really, there's, there's more elephants. There are there are more elephants just over the ridge. That's why he's moving in this direction relatively fast. I think he's also just connected to them because he's heading in their direction too now. I was wondering why he was sort of feeding and moving the way he was. Looks like they're on a march to Gary Dam, Juma Waterhole. But in the places that I've lived in Tanzania, I've been very, very lucky. I've only lived in very remote places and those remote places have been so exclusive that it's only been myself and the guides that I work with and our vehicles to, for the most part, but it's also been areas where I've been allowed to do walking safaris, almost wilderness areas where there are no roads, there it's, it's just vast thousands and thousands of square kilometers of elephants. I would live my days out there if I could, would if I could. I'm going to beat you to the ladies, Mr. Ellie, because I'm going to see them too. But I think they already, they got kind of marching. Are you going to feed on that sickle bush? That's a beautiful shot, though, standing on the mound. That's too much to, to miss up. But there I can see in the just on the horizon is an Ellie cow. He might just be coming closer to talk to them. They might be relatives. It's just me. I hope he does interact. That's beautiful. Oh wow, that's beautiful. That's why I live why I was on it have a noon with an Ellie like this. And you, of course, all our viewers. I do this for you and me. And 
wild earth. He's still heading north at a bit more than an amble, a bit more than a kind of gait that an elephant bull walks at when he's a nice slut. Eating her out in the ditch. if he is going to be meeting up with them. Well, I'm going to just leave him briefly. I want to go and see who that is. Elephant wise. Mostly we have. But there are places in East Africa that are just so far out of the way that you can be the only vehicle and it could be quite When do boy elephants get booted out of the herd? I think that's from Halal. But as I was saying, there are areas of Tanzania that are really wonderful and some of the best elephant areas. Oh, she's got a tiny bull off to the left. She's kind of looking in his direction. But this little baby, ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, this quite a new little baby. They are downwind of us, so she knows we're here, little one. And there he is, he's wandering this way now. I think he's picked up their scent of where they've been walking. And he's now coming over this way. And I'm hoping that we're going to see a little bit of interaction. What's really interesting with it, elephants is when they haven't seen each other for a while and they know each other, which I'm sure they do. Uh, funnily enough, here's some monarchs mating. A lot of monarchs out here on quarantine at the moment. African monarchs. Anyways. We'll get back to monarchs mating. If those two are, there'll be others. But it would really be nice if we can just sort of sit, watch from a distance as he's coming off, um, coming closer and have a look at this little child that's maybe only a few months old. So tiny, it still fits under mom's belly. She's taking little one away and the other child now also actually running up to her so we're going to see if she's going to accept his presence or not. They must have picked up his scent. Now, oh look at that. She's actually taking the kids away. She's not interested in him at all. And it has nothing to do with us, I have to be honest with you. Um, they did have our scent, they didn't react to it at all because they were accustomed to vehicles. Um, the thing is that they walk straight up. But interesting also how the 
other child of this mama is, and she's a little girl, I think, how she's being quite defensive too. They've got the baby between them, they're both facing outwards. So, let's see what... This is about now she's coming back to the bull. Maybe they just picked up the scent of something or something wasn't right for her. I just keep the little one between them and the bull greet now. You, whoever you're greeting. Um, vertical exchange, quite strangely. They're all eating marulas now. Of course, I don't know what the history is. They could have been together all morning. They could have been together for the last week or two. They could have, they, they undoubtedly know each other. Why she ran with the kids or why the kids took off like they did, I don't know. Um, certainly had nothing to do with us or the bull, I suppose, or maybe they just picked up a little bit of a must scent and they thought that they were going to get hassled by a bull. She's not a very old mom. And I've often been asked the question about how the, 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 the matriarch, how that, that succession takes place, how it is that an elephant becomes a matriarch. And what you have is, when you have a fairly large family uh, of of a matriarch and her daughters and their children and several ages of children, you are going to get to the point where the, where, where the, 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 the age-old matriarch is going to pass away. And when she does, she will have passed on enough knowledge to all of her daughters who up till that point would have been quite happy under, under her, with, with her guiding them. But by the time she passes on, she will have been able to enlighten them and teach them enough for them to become their own matrix and so what I'm guessing here is that she's recently probably become her own matriarch and that teenager it's not quite a teenager but that that older girl the older sister of this little calf look at this the little calf's getting a good lesson from its older sister, how to do things. It's got a lot to learn. A beautiful sort of family shot, actually. To see a bull with a cow and calf, two calves, under a marula tree. It's rather special, actually. There, she's once she wants to greet him. He's playing ignorant. And now, now, he wants to greet her, she's there, there's the greeting. Just touching each other on the mouth, and he's now also just surreptitiously getting... A little bit of a smell of her urine, of well, of her urine, I suppose that which has dribbled. Got Aaron Kruger, and well, I can't really tell if it's a little boy or a little girl yet, but. That's a little boy. Bull has moved off. He's been very courteous. He's had 
he's shown exceptional manners in terms of elephant society. He's approached, but not approached. He's made the first ignored the back of the herd. Uh, I can't remember who that was from, but actually they don't get kicked out of the herd. Um, there are very few things that actually get physically booted or chased. Uh, well, there are quite a few, I suppose, but elephants are not one of them. And if we were to watch this little boy, now in his first year of life, he would be going through very much the same as our children go through in their first 10 years. They're the same, the, the amount they need to learn, the dexterity, the, uh, the knowledge, the, the need for learning. The lessons that they learn, there's so much that's going to happen in his first 10 years. And then, as a little boy, is going to go through puberty, probably in between the ages of 12 and 14. But from about, already when he's only 5, 6, 7, he's not going to need that closer contact with mom and sister. So he's going to, there are going to be times when we, if we were to be back here in 5 years' time, and we were to see the same old girl with... two calves, and I'm sure there might be others then too, because, well, little, when she becomes a teenager, that second one, she's going to have her own baby, puberty, you know, mid, a bit for a few years, and then there are times when he'll actually be lagging behind by sometimes even up to a day, depending on where they are, but he'll always be in vocal contact. with mom and the family but he'll seek out more and more his own company and the company of other or younger bulls how comfortable this little one is with big sister oh something gave it a fright <laughs> something must have been moving something did you see how big sister was feeling with her leg She's actually, she, she was feeling behind her with her hind leg to see what, where the other little one was. And Paula are quite interested in us, or what's going on. Maybe they want to see baby elephant. Little one's... ...up to big sister with it. I'm not too sure about things. It's trying to be intimidating. It's trying very hard to be brave. Is that a marula fruit? Run back to your mother. Put into perspective, size-wise, little Take <laughs> That physical touch is so important to it. It's almost constantly got to be touching either mom or sibling or aunt. Right underneath mom's belly. Tiny little thing. Kind of think of something the size wise that's probably about as tall as a Great Dane, maybe. Sleep at Big Stad. Oh,
she's probably between eight and ten, I'd say. She's a small-bodied girl, but she's a very brave Ellie, the way she was behaving. And then okay, so back to the bulls, the young boys. They just reach an age where they they leave the herd to join up with, in their late teens, to join up with bachelor herds or other bulls, and they then develop bonds with the bulls in this, and, and they become part of the bull society, as it were, of elephants within a particular area or within a particular... that they move in, because they do move over vast areas. But it'll invariably encompass the areas they moved as a, as as a calf with the the, the the mom and the breeding herds, and as bulls they then pretty much come into contact with their own families, and I guess in in the same sense, come into contact with their offspring and they socialize with them and they can spend any amount of time with them. Sometimes a couple of minutes, as we've seen now, this family on a But it's just a complicated process. Maybe one day it'll be easy to just sort of do a field test. That little one picked up a scent of something again, coming from the south, that made her run back to mom. Net, I think it is, asking a question if there's any plant species that's in danger because of overutilization by elephants. Yeah, no. I wouldn't say that we have a with rising. I suppose on the Chobe River, Chobe National Park in Botswana, where a lot of elephants are forced into a really small corridor, as it were, along the Chobe River, so that. that yeah, she's feeling with her back leg, trying to feel where the youngster is so that she doesn't back up into him. But he'll touch her now. There we go. Legs. All day thing to consider just being these mindless, thoughtless creatures, but every animal that you can see on the planet has all the same organs that we have, so there's no reason why they can't feel things and think things and experience things. But elephants are just these wonderful big beings that are just the most amazing and the most calming and the most wonderful to spend time with the beautiful sunset that might be coming soon. We're on quarantine. I think that if I can just explain it, there's a white pole just behind her. That's the mast, the whole antenna that helps with the broadcast. That's how close we are to sort of the main Juma camp.
Boyatela. We were right on the edge of the clearing, which is just outside the lodge. Drink. The other one's playing with a stick. Hello, Ryan. Ryan's in Utah. Nice to hear from you, Ryan. Do animals here have a fight or or do they only have a flight response? Ryan, animals everywhere, every single living creature, whether it's an insect or no matter what it is, there is a built-in fight or flight reaction to anything. That is why in a lot of cases, no matter whether it's the offending fight or flight, um, I don't really particularly like the whole concept of fight or flight because it, it, is, it is, well, it's not that it's general, it's sort of, it, it, it's so limiting to what animals actually do. And excuse me, being in a behavioral trait, being something that is governed by more than just that instinct of other options that an animals can resort to, but it's, it's, it's a behavioral thing. So it's not as cut and dried as knowing that either one or the other is going to happen. It's, Little one's drinking now. Big sis, you're in the way. But I don't know anything really. Well, I suppose there are. There are a lot of animals that would prefer to just flee rather than fight. Um, but I think at, at all, no matter what species it is, no matter where in the world, I think no matter what species it is, you are going to get a reaction out of it and I suppose it all depends on at which point they feel threatened and that might be just by your presence. As a human, or it might be because you want to touch it or pick it up or you're inhibiting it or Engaging it in ways that are, are, are in one thing we were going to see that. Curls the trunk up. It's hard to see where it's putting its trunk, but it curls the trunk up so that it can get to the memory. <coughs> and quite accommodatingly, Mom is just standing there letting it drink. Just getting news about Lion. Yeah, sorry. Alex, sorry, I had to turn you down. I had the other radio going. Casey, how's New York at the moment? I believe while I've been home, I believe there's been some pretty heavy snowfalls and storms up the East Coast all the way, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Maine even. I think Maine got hit pretty bad. Um, Stacy. 
would a predator go for this youngster? Possibly. No, I think we, 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 well, we've seen that they are pretty protective over it. And if there was any threat, we would see that they would hold that baby really, really tight, close in between the two of them. Um, but also it's a case of where the predators in this part of the world are accustomed to taking baby elephant because not every animal, or not every, let's face it, we're mostly talking about cats here, a hyena maybe, a wild dog not likely. Um, hyena could probably wear down mom eventually if they had a big enough pack. But the only thing we really got to consider that might make a move on a baby elephant is, is lion. And although there are lion that hunt elephant in, in other parts of Africa, and even in Kruger, there is a pride that I believe have been hunted. not lion hunting elephant especially babies because that, that, that is a very vault look at that he's pushing against sister's shoulder it's so cute like trying to engage a play every day after lunch it was on an open area on the opposite side of the lodge very similar to this in fact almost identical Except instead of a dam, there was the Sand River. Look at that little thing. And wants to play, and sister just wants to eat. And I just go and have... You know, there are, there are prides of lion that, that have even taken down fairly large elephants. I know of a pride of lion in... I know of a pride of lion in Tanzania. There's course a lot of lion up in Chobe. We were talking about Chobe earlier where elephant populations have are, are quite high numbers and a lot of elephant have to get to the Chobe River to a very mm, small area of the Chobe River for their excuse me for their daily water. And lion have learned how to how to hunt elephant there. But I don't think any of our lion it would take a long time for them to to, to suss it out and learn that they've got to separate cows and calves. They've got to cause havoc at night to be able to split them up. But you see, there's another factor that is... ...in Botswana. There are certain social bonds and certain things that that break down, I guess. I mean, maternal care, social structure, all the kind, all the kind of things that really happen in. Uh, in overcrowding situations, in any species that is a social species or a gregarious species, well, not so much gregarious as much as it is social and and nurturing the way. Look at it, it's coming, running back to mom. And try and move so we can see it again. Mom's going to move down to the other car now too. I don't have to move. This is the most of the speed. Not have them fear our presence or alter their behaviour because we're sitting here and watching. And I think Scott's going to actually come and join us. Pretty sunset. I'm gonna what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just get to a little bit to the east of them, so we can maybe just get a nice early sunset shot here. Just show you what that's like. Got a herd of. Impala in front of us that we've been seeing in the background for a long time. They 
You're all intrigued, aren't you? You're all nervous because there's a bit of wind. Look at them, their ears are all forward, their ears are all... And the big ram that's about to chase them all. Okay, we can park here next to this this wattle because she's not going to come through the wattle. She might come part of the other trees. It's not a wattle. She's also vulnerable. Yeah, let's face it, she's, she's a single cow with two children. And so she's relying on this daughter of hers. To a large extent to help her to protect the child. And I suppose fortunately there aren't elephant eating lion here and she's probably the easiest target to to be able to harass and and up from a group and but it's got to be or growing up or I suppose there's always the first time that lion tries something like that and then maybe it's because the opportunity is there and there was that Elephant calf I was telling you about in the mid-90s at, at Inyati Game Lodge. It was, we, we, we had this elephant calf. I arrived there and it was across the, the river from the lodge in this beautiful open area. And it never left the open area. It appeared, well, I assumed it, or I diagnosed it as being deaf because of when I, when I walked with it, it couldn't hear me or didn't react to me until it amongst the, the herd car for a child that, that is not going to make it very well or very easily. Anyways, for whatever reason it was abandoned, I would head out over onto the open area every day after lunch and I and I'd try, and, I'd try and diagnose things. It had a couple of pussy wounds on it, which I thought might have been TB. But other than that, the only thing I could think of was in part out night to the lodge. And we found the lion on it. She's raising her trunk, smelling something. Off to get some water, I think. I don't know. Maybe there's rain in the air. Yeah, look, rubbing the eye. No. Mama was doing when I was mentioning. That's why she doesn't have any of those white little things in her eye, because she's been rubbing her eyes. Can you hear the radio? Pardon? Can you hear the radio? No. Oh, I was talking so... turned it down and I forgot that I did. No, I can. Did Alex say something? Yeah, Alex is not trying to get hold of you. Uh, okay, my volume's up again. Sorry, I had to turn down. <laughs> <laughs> 